Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH, and today we're gonna to take a look at this thing right here. Now this is a Supermicro X12 STN-E. And you may be looking at it and say, hey, I have seen many small computers in my day, Patrick. Why is this so exciting? And I wanna tell you exactly why. This has things like PCIe Gen 4, two and a half gig ethernet. It's using the brand new 11th gen Intel Core processors, embedded processors, which is an important distinction there. But at the same time, I mean, this is a complete system and it is very small. And just to give you some idea in terms of the form factor, this is called a three and a half inch single board computer SBC. And why it's called a three and a half inch is if you thought, oh, hey, maybe that's because it's the size of a hard drive, you're totally right. Just to kind of give you guys some idea of where we're going with this, this thing is literally the size of a three and a half inch hard drive, and yet it's an entire computer. That's awesome, and we're gonna show you some options with it that I think are gonna blow some of your minds. And one of the things that I really like about this is that it's small enough that I don't have to hang it, don't have to hold it like a boom box or anything like that. I can just hold it in my hand and actually show you guys this stuff. So I'm super excited because that makes my life way easier. With that, let's get to the hardware. All right, so while we're on it, let's go look at this front side. And there are basically two features here, and there's also something that I think we should just kind of talk about and just address here. So the basic features that you're gonna see on the top part of this, other than the ports, which we're gonna to get to when we get to the side, is really this just giant heatsink. Now, this is the X12 STN-E, which has the heatsink, but there's also a dash W-O-H-S, which I call woes but the Woes version of this is without heatsink. And you can actually buy this without the heatsink. It's, I don't know, it might be a couple bucks cheaper. I don't exactly know because it's a pre-release product, but I'm gonna show you what that actually means and what you can actually do because you can actually run this in a fanless configuration using a different heatsink. For most of our testing, just as a note, we did use this heatsink because we didn't have the chassis that was you know, able to go and cool this thing passively but I do now. But since we're looking at the heatsink version of it, and I'm very worried that I'm gonna break this because it is a pre-release product and I don't know if I can get another one uh, if I do break it. So we're just gonna kind of talk about it like this and we're gonna show B-roll of kind of some of the other things that we have. Now, the processor on this is actually an Intel Core i5-1145GRE. And that is a specific industrial embedded part that Intel makes, you know, specifically for those markets. So this is not just something that you'd find in a laptop or a normal desktop or anything like that. This is really made for the embedded market. That specifically means that we also have things like this is soldered onto the motherboard. You definitely, you know, this isn't socketed, so you can't actually go change this CPU out. The last dash E that's in the model name that actually means that that's what tells us that this is the Core i5 model. I think Supermicro also will have Core i7, Core i3, and maybe some lower end models as well. So there are different SKU levels depending on you know what you kind of need. You can go pick, but you do have to pick that before you buy the board because it is soldered on here. And in the industrial and embedded market, that's really important because if you're you know have to worry about vibration and stuff like that, having a soldered CPU is actually more reliable than having a socketed CPU, and that's why you typically would see that in something like this. And we normally talk about performance last, but let's just get it out of the way here because I think that's the important part, but let's just kind of keep it all on the CPU. And specifically, well, let's just kind of give you some idea in terms of some of the things that we see. Now, this is a 28 watt TDP max CPU. You can also configure it to be different TDPs, but at the end of the day, you know, you don't necessarily have like 100 watts or something like that to play with because well, that's not really the idea with this. This is really designed for the embedded market and really kind of passively cooled chassis and stuff like that. And because of that, you know, our performance is not necessarily, you know, top of charts and everything, but it is really good performance. It's like probably a little bit less, somewhere ballpark around a Core i5-10500T that we look at, which is a 35 watt TDP part that we see in a lot of like, you know, one liter PCs and desktops and stuff like that. And so, you know, just in terms of performance, that's not too bad, but because it's an 11th gen part, it's also a 10 nanometer part, which means that we get different features of that 11th gen Tiger Lake core that we didn't necessarily get in previous generations. And that's really some of the magic behind this. Specifically, not only do you get things like you still get quick sync and all that kind of stuff, but because you do 
have the Iris XE graphics from Intel on this. There are other things that you just kind of get as part of the entire package. And one of the things that you get is you also get the ability to go do things like AI inference because you have DL boost and all those types of accelerators. Now we're doing an entire separate series and we've you know already kind of looked at some using some of these things like you know AI boost or DL boost in some of the Intel platforms really on the server side, but the same kind of idea applies here. And the real idea is that you can use the you know encode and decode accelerators that are actually in this system to go and look at like things like video feeds or some something like that. Then you can do AI inferencing, not necessarily needing an external GPU that would take you know, additional power. You can just do that on the chip. You are gonna probably have to go and use Intel's tools for that. So you're gonna have to go get your hands into the One API toolkit. But the idea is basically you don't need an external GPU. You can run this all passively all on a single x86 platform. So that's really kind of what the idea is behind this processor. But let's kind of keep moving on and let's go talk about the rest of the board because I think that that is actually some of the more interesting parts. Now, something that you're gonna see around this board is that there's a whole bunch of headers. And there are a couple of these headers that are like COM ports. And if you're looking at this for the first time, you may say, hey, I don't recognize a lot of those ports. A good example of that is actually the power header that's on here. So while you can see the fan power, which is your normal kind of four pin PWM fan power connector, the one next to it, well, that's actually the A pin, that's actually the power connector for this entire board. So you don't just have like kind of a normal DC power jack or something like that you have something that's a little bit different. And that actually causes a little bit of challenge because what we did was we had to use a benchtop power supply to power this thing for most of our testing. And then we just finally got all of the power stuff that we needed just recently. For example, there are a couple different ways that you would power it. One of them is that you can get this cable. And what this basically allows you to do is turn this into something that you can go power off of, you know, kind of more standard kind of power inputs that you'd see in a lot of systems. And so you can actually just go pop this thing in there and you need that kind of adapter to make it work. But in the chassis that we're gonna show, you actually have the power cable already built in. And the reason that it's built in is actually because it goes to the rear and it has a locking power connector. And so that's really the idea is for an industrial, you know, kind of application. You don't necessarily wanna have just something that could just pop out like a normal DC barrel jack, right? Just pops out what you need is something to secure it there and that's actually how that solution is built so this is one of those systems that i think you can go build a or motherboards that i think you can go build into another system but at the same time this does have a lot of benefit by just going and getting you know some of the cases that are really built for this and that's why we're going to show you that in a little bit now the other little tiny feature is that you actually get a single sata port now i don't really think that a lot of these systems are going to be using sata i think m.2 is going to be a lot more common but you do have one here and I'm going to talk about M.2. Well, why don't we get to the other side and actually look at why M.2 is going to be popular. But because we're on an 11th gen core, we get a couple of really cool features that we can see on the bottom of this motherboard. And specifically, we get two SODIMM slots, which means we can do up to 64 gigabytes of memory. But in this generation, we get DDR4 3200 support. So you can actually get higher speed and higher memory bandwidth and you can get on a lot of Intel's other embedded products. Well, at least for now. So that's awesome. Aside from the two DDR4 SODIMM, slots, you also get a total of three PCIe slots that you're going to see on the bottom. Now, these are, of course, M.2 slots, but we're going to talk about all three of them because there's actually something that's a little bit different here. Specifically, what you're going to see is the first slot. Now, this is just an M.2 slot, and this one can do either SATA, but it can also do PCIe Gen 3, and it has all that kind of stuff built into that, so you can go have an SSD or something like that there. The next slot, though, is actually pretty interesting. This is an M.2 2230 slot, and this thing can actually take, you know, usually you, you put something like a wireless LAN card there or something like that. This little slot also supports CNBI. So if you want to go and have, you know, a wireless solution for that, you can totally use that. And then finally, we get this little thing over here, which is another M.2 slot, but this one is a PCIe Gen 4 by 4 slot. So that means you can actually get PCIe Gen 4 speeds in a little tiny, you know, board like this. And you'll probably have noticed this, but there's also a little SIM card slot under the M.2 2230 slot. So you have that there as well. All right, so let's get to what is, I guess, the front or rear or whatever I.O. I don't know on a three and a half inch, you know, single board computer what exactly this is. But let's just kind of look at the I.O. panel because I think that's kind of exciting. Specifically here, what you're going to see is that we have a number of different options, but we're going to start over here with the two and a half gig Ethernet ports. There's not just one of them. There are two in the system. 
And if you're salivating at the possibilities of having dual two and a half gig ethernet connections, well, I can totally understand that. I do think that the price of this is gonna end up being a little bit more than you would just need for just kind of a basic, you know, router or firewall or something like that, because it really is kind of focused on all of this display uh, outputs and also, you know, the, the AI inferencing, all that kind of stuff. So I don't necessarily think that you'd use this just for like, if the only thing we are gonna do is use it for a firewall, I don't think you'd use it for that. But the fact that it has two and a half gig ethernet, I'm super excited about, we're starting to see more devices with it. And it's really awesome that we're starting to see that on the single board computers. Now, when it comes to USB ports, there are headers for USB 2, and I think you can actually get like four USB 2 ports out of this. So if you just kind of want that kind of more legacy standard, you totally can get that out of here, uh, but you're gonna have to go through a header to go do that. But on the back of the system, you're gonna see that we actually have four USB ports. Now, three of those are type A ports. One of them is a type C port, and these are USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports. That means that we actually get 10 gigabit per second USB ports on this. Now, in terms of display outputs, you're gonna see that we have two HDMI, I think 2.0B ports on the back of this, but that's not the entire story for this because the USB type C port actually has alt mode display port enabled. So you can get a third display off of that. And then also you can see this header up here, which is actually the LVDS header. And that allows you to get a fourth display output. So this little board can actually power four display output puts and you can actually get 4K60 out of this thing. Now, earlier I mentioned that this board is really designed to go into things, you know, like industrial applications, embedded applications. So it is built with all the industrial, you know, high temp or, or wide temperature range and all those kind of components that you would kind of expect for that market. But this heatsink is not really ideal for that because this basically assumes that you're gonna have a little bit of airflow, or at least we put airflow on it uh, while we were testing it on the bench. But I think that most people are gonna wanna put a little airflow over a heatsink like this, just because it's just not, it's just not that big. And then you also just always are worried about you know, well, what kind of enclosure is it gonna go into and are you gonna have airflow and all that kind of stuff. So instead, what they actually have is that Supermicro actually has a chassis, which I think is like the E101 chassis that will actually fit this thing. And it took me a little while, but I was finally able to get it after we were done with testing this version. So the first thing you do is you basically take off the heat sink and then you get this giant metal block. Now I can tell you, this thing feels like it weighs about as much, if not more than this entire assembly. It is a just giant hunk of metal. And on this giant hunk of metal, you're gonna see basically two sides. The first side you're gonna see over here is that this is actually where the processor, uh, you know, pinout is gonna be. And then on the flip side of this, we're gonna go and this is actually where you would go and attach it to the case. So you basically have a little sandwich where you have the processor on this side and then you have the case on this side. And then that, this big block provides the thermal interface that basically is pulling heat from the processor and pushing it out to the case and then distributing it to the environment. And this is the actual case. Now this is a CSE 101, I think dash 03, and there are a couple different versions of this, but this is the actual one that I think pairs really well with that board and it took a little while to get. Uh, so they definitely want this one back. Uh, real fast because I think there may not be a ton of them yet. And basically on the top of this case, you can actually see that we have kind of the fins and this is a pretty heavy, just all metal case. And this is kind of what you would expect. On the bottom is basically just flat. Now on the face of this, this is the opposite side of the IO panel that we just looked at on the actual board itself. But you actually get, you know, all the kind of ports that you don't necessarily get on that motherboard. And there are wires in there that you just kind of connect to the custom headers that Supermicro has. For example, you can see that we have an array of COM ports. And along with the array of four COM ports, we also get four USB 2 ports. Those are the ones that I mentioned while we were kind of going through the headers and USB. The other one that I think is kind of important is just the fact that you do have a locking power adapter if you want it. Now, of course, there are other options that you can do if you want power, but this particular one, you can get a locking power adapter. So we actually have threads on the barrel jack over here. And then when you go put the little DC connection in, it's very hard to do that without looking, but you can actually go and you just kind of screw it in place. And when you screw it in place, you can't pull it out and so it's like secure, like pretty, actually pretty darn secure on the system. So you don't really have to worry about like, you know, if, if this thing's shaking around or something like that, your, your power supply coming out and then you lose power to the system and then you, know, you have to go replace it. And it's of course always gonna be somewhere that's really hard to get to. So this just kind of prevents that. And that's why you see this type of solution. Of course there are other ones, but just kind of want to talk about that real fast. Now the other side of this actually has the power button and it also has the cutouts for all of the IO ports that we looked at on the board itself. Now, when we originally did our testing, we didn't necessarily do it in that chassis because if you can't tell, we're actually doing this video twice. Uh, this is being recorded on two different days because some of the assets we did uh, a couple weeks ago and now we have the case finally so we can actually finish the thing and show you. Now, just in terms of power consumption, 
we did test this on our benchtop power supply because we had DC power supply that we were just using until we could get all this stuff. But what we saw there is that we were really kind of in that like kind of mid single digit range in terms of mid to high single digit range in terms of our idle power consumption. In terms of our maximum power consumption, our system, we never got it over 35 watts. I do think that you can probably go higher than that, but it may also depend on what kind of system you have or what kind of enclosure and cooling you have. So I don't necessarily think this is gonna be one that you know, you're gonna really wanna push up in most cases up to like 100 watts and you know really fill everything you can with like the hottest ssds and all that kind of stuff i just don't think that you really have the cooling capacity in this chassis for that but on the other hand i do think it is great the fact that we have this system and we can just go put it into an embedded chassis that doesn't use any fans or anything like that again we did use a fan and we that's why we use that four pin pwm fan header because we actually did use that when we were testing the board and we got our performance numbers, but at the same time, I do think that this is a very nice little solution. So let's talk about pricing real quick. I think that this system, my guess, is that when it hits the street is probably gonna be somewhere in the seven to $800 range, which is definitely expensive. And a lot of people are gonna be like, wait, I can get a Raspberry Pi for way less than that. And you totally can. But at the same time, you know, this is not the same class as a Raspberry Pi, right? I mean, this is definitely bigger. It's the size of a three and a half inch hard drive. You can definitely see that as it's going across my face right there. You can see the fact that this is a lot bigger, but it also has a ton more capabilities. I mean, these are like kind of, you know, the 11th gen core. You also get the GPU that has the encoding and decode because you have quick sync. You also have things like the AI acceleration. You have DDR4 3200 dual channel memory. So you can go up to 64 gigs of memory. You have the multiple M.2 slots, including PCIe Gen 4, which you know you just didn't have in previous generations. So that is definitely a new capability. So this is definitely not gonna be the cheapest system that you're gonna find. And the reason that it costs as much as it does is because it's really meant for kind of those kind of larger kind of embedded types of applications. But it's also one that I just thought was really cool. And so I definitely wanted to go take a look at it because nobody else has even looked at these things so i was like yeah let's go look at it before it even comes out let's go so like show you guys and also i know that we have a lot of people on the sth main site that do kind of embedded systems and so you know they're definitely going to like this and at, this is one that i just kind of you know we're working with it and we we're just going to do a main site article but then i was like ah, actually it's kind of cool let's go do a video on it as well just so you guys can see it and so i hope you really like this early look at a kind of really cool platform we got two and a half gig ethernet we got pci gen 4 i mean these are a lot of new features that we just didn't have on previous generation boards in this class. So I'm super excited about it and hopefully you guys are too. And hey, if you did like this video, well, why don't you give it a like, click subscribe, turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day.